Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Chavena Barber Press reading series. And tonight we have three wonderful Romanian authors, and I'm very excited to have them here tonight to share their poetry with us. I will introduce them by their first name, only to be less formal, but still stay professional. And I want to give a huge, huge thank you to Claudia for organizing this. So yay. <laughs> thank you so much. And so our first reader is Clara. She is a Romanian-born poet with an MFA in poetry from Adelphi University, recipient of the Robert Moroth Poetry Award. Her poems and translations appeared in Ambit, Wax Wing, The Cortland Review, and elsewhere. Her second poetry collection, Praise the Unburied, was published in 2021 with Chap Finch Press. She is the review editor of ISRA, an online journal of translation. And I give you Clara. Thank you, Gloria. And thank you, Claudia, for invitation and sort of like, you know, facilitating this for us, for the rest of us. I'm excited to be reading with uh, her and Lucia, but I'm also very happy to have so many people around us tonight. So thank you. Um, I will start by reading a, a poem from my um, um, uh, mostly recent uh, poetry collection and then uh, continue to read uh, from uh, my recent preoccupations, which include hybrid poetry. So I'm going to read the uh, Juihitsu and then end with uh, a poem that I wrote on the occasion of um, Mircea Cartarescu's visit uh, last spring um, in Dallas. Before reading, I always like to joke when I teach at least in front of my students, asking them to bear with, with me, you know, do not mind my thick accent and my nasal voice. So I'll be doing the same with you guys. What occasionally makes sense. I might be just like my mother's mother for all I know, sharp tongued and making things up as they come along. Words grape juice, meals, tonguing her teeth before a chopping onion to make ostropel de puik mama liguza, to be eaten around a three-legged wooden table, our backs bent over the steaming pot. In the plum tree in front of the summer kitchen, a magpie eyeing the little chicks roaming along the red hen, some inviting promise in the browsing yellow, and the birds knows it. She hungers to name it, this craving that fills the, the tender July air, still with flavors and lures. We're all women of appetite in this house. Grandma makes mousse every fall, crushing dark and fruit by hand. We drink it the next days, sediment and froth, and eat pastrama with it. My mother cuts the mutton in tight, in thin slices, rubs salt, pepper, chili, and thyme against it, rolls it up, keeps it cool for days in a row. Then it hangs in the affumatoire, where the aroma tingles my nostrils and gives me goosebumps. Later, the three of us breaking bread as evening comes chattering down, and this very alphabet of love blooms into our veins. When morning comes, I crave to smell my mother's smell, all honeycomb, vinegar, and exhaustion. The crook of her neck is where this intoxication begins, every purple morning for the next 30 years. I will then wake up to a mouthful of needles whose wholeness once they put much as I bleed my way through their eyes. Slivers of past conversations, gestures and wooders nest under every fold of skin. Vest tomorrow laid ahead, jottings of poems scratch at every white corner and not even a daughter can give me back the pleasure of the mouth, the seduction of endless noons filled with albacca zapada, salata de vinete, the in-between hugs and share layers of fatigue, natter and laughter. Except my daughter wears your cuffs the same way, and grandma reminds me every Saturday when I visit of the way hunger never apologizes, and there are no rooms in our bodies without ghosts. Thank you. So, thank you, guys. Hi, Adela. Um, 
So this was uh, this um, this poem um, is part of the praise the unburied. Um, I, I also I'm also a translator, so a much of my fascination with language got captured in this following poem that is um, about translation. So it's called On Translation. A mouth is a beautiful thing to be born into, a potent realm of tastes, wordlings, the ears, everything that burns to flesh out. You learn to move the tongue like the sea, ebbing the edges, one lap after the other, then flowing back into the unuttered. The way a mouth can trace the hanging fruit of doubt before it congeals into the mind, fall as if held, roll, nape to the forehead, a teething little mouse tracing fallacies to the room before it wheels back into ink dreams. This sheet of paper stands witness to the way the mouth does things with words, their stillness and stubbornness alike, poking at their core, fleshy cores, biting into their sanctity of solitude. A palimpsest of leaped out strikes, the blurred space between misunsense and intentions, tonguing the unsaid before the unsaid gains weight and all serving sway softly into solid matter. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, okay. Um, so lately I've been working on a collection of hybrid poetry, which is sort of like, um, you know, mixing personal um, uh, bits, uh, bits of personal essays with um, um, uh, poems, um, trying my hand at different uh, formal forms. And um, I have discovered the Jui Hitsu and I fell in love with it. Uh, and the following um, is called, um, just a second. It's called um, Everyday, um, absences and it is a sort of a longer um piece uh, that um um uh, as said blends uh, uh personal uh, um essay beats with uh, poems so everyday absences the misread body tinkering between revise and rehash a pair of big jungle cats in the same cage the patterning and ritual of loss Come here 10 times before the tall Ikea mirror. Scrub face with circular movements before sunscreen. Stumble upon a breath mint box filled with milk teeth. Sharing space with a nail clipper, upper drawer, bedroom cabinet. Name, knowing from within. This Ruihitsu cannot go on without a feathering, a home. Bristle the brush, let pigment impregnate the skin of the poem. A screaming nest of word cells. Soft, drowsy, a perfect eye spot on its tail, a smattering of color, at times a gossamer letter to the ear of a deaf god. Int intimacy as a product of distance and estrangement. At language level, slurping words in Romanian, macerating their roots and tendrils before regurgitating into an English open palm, choking on residue, revise and rehash. The temperature of dreams as they simmer behind bustling temples. My hands smelling of lovage, love and age. The patience it takes to learn how to make a soothing soup. How to live without salt and be salty. A dazzling speck of unrest. My kida and her zoomies outside the window. Every now and then a gust through the branches of the cherry tree. Sending a kita glitter my way. When she takes a break, she crashes into the grass and her shaved, scarred belly stings my eye. A storm of questions melting under the right tongue. Was it my right? We learn everything through the open window. The faint sound of the falling magnolia petals, the cry of the lost owlet, the full-throated song of the velvet skies. Mostly, we held the power to call night into being. You ask for a clear uterus. I comply, half content, half yearning for a change of heart, of chances, of view. Inside this house of cards, the blinds bang the wall, the bed dreams of plate. Any nerve in the palm you rest on my pubis could be a tree, heavy with barren fruit, hiccuped flowers and inciting speculation, except for the nails aching to trust into every inch of skin. 
then mason jars on the windowsill, halved apricots sprawled in honey and furling their shin. One spoonful, it's God's finger brushing the roof of the mouth. Goosebumps, another God's breath on the back of the neck. You hand me a glass of lemon water, the fatigue swiftness of yet another July sky. Nouns that dress the summer. Salada de vinete, plimbăr cu chida, halbă de bere, caniculă, ciorbă de fasole, dermatită periorală, pură de pepene roșu, caietul de rețete al mamei, prăjitură cu, vin și, cu vișine. Folding a sheet of paper in pleats, two times, to cool the faces of the neighbor's twins. On the boy's forehead, a birthmark shape as a holder. I sit between them on the curb, little hands diving for cherries into a big bowl. The girl rests her head on my shoulder. Intoxication is always baby sweat, to hold against the roof of the mouth. The womb humps back. Its void thickens to shriek. It begs to be suited. And I remember I left my tongue in the butcher's den, numb from my own howling. The Akita muzzle pushes the memory back into the skin pocket. Inside this fraying house, Kida and I, licking amber leaf. Thank you. Um, so, dear Gloria, let me know how, how um, I'm doing with time. Can I have time for another poem? Yes, please. Thank you. So, uh, last spring we had a um, famous Romanian writer, Mircea Cărtărescu, uh, on a tour um, in US, and he stopped in Dallas uh, for a reading and um, uh, I attended the event. It was amazing. Um, I was there with uh, uh, his translator into English, who is also uh, my advisor, Sean Cutter. So um, it was uh, in this very nice um, um, bookstore um, that had a backyard and it was filled with lights and people could sort of like, go, they had to go through the bookstore, grab a book, you know, have it signed and get the cocktail. So it was kind of like an amazing experience. It was called, it is called the Wild Detectives and the event was on the occasion of the 10 years uh, anniversary celebration. So this is a bit, a little bit of context behind the, the poem. And um, the poem is called, While Attending the Deep Vellum 10 Year of Anniversary Party at the Wild Detectives. The Dallas streetcar um, runs between downtown and Oak Cliff and goes back to 1872 when it was mule drawn nine cars and 18 mules. I googled the one in Bucharest. Turn out it was born in 1871, drawn by horses. One fact that someone makes me feel more patriotic than usual. My yellow t-shirt matches the local one. I sip warm beer and listen to the reading. On the lit wooden stage, the Romanian writer's writer wife wears an intoxicating fuchsia dress, adorned with a wide blue belt and a beady necklace. She reads in English with a thick accent, like mine. Her voice is soft, familiar. Behind me, two Iranian women in my grad program are whispering in an elegant Persian. I want another beer, except I have to step on people's toes to walk back to the bar. The funny lady serving is called Juanita. Her almond-shaped tear glasses make her look so sophisticated. I bet she's read everything in the bookstore, maybe just the good books. The guy next to me barely touches his paloma. Such a waste. The heart Juanita puts into that cocktail. I feel the hum of the streetcar in the sole of my flats. The wet in the air is reeking of early April. We're all swimming inside a snow globe. The writer's deft fingers keep shaking it, and we all wobble inside this womb of language. One big fetus, several hearts. Thank you. Thank you so much. Clara, that was wonderful. Your description and use of images. Oh, I love it. Thank you. Our next reader is Lucia. She is the author of six books of poetry, including Immigrant Prodigal Daughter, Kelsey Books 2023, and Train Ride to Bucharest, Sheet Metal Press 2017 which was the winner of the Eugene Paul Nasser Poetry Prize. She is the 20, excuse me, 2021-22 Dutchess County Poet Laureate and teaches at Sunny Dutchess. And I give you Lucia. 
Thank you. Um, thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Claudia, Clara, and everybody in the room. Uh, Clara, uh, so you are in Romania right now? That is so beautiful. Yeah, and made, listening to your poem makes me uh, miss the food of home. And most of you uh, are getting me in trouble over here. Uh, it's so nice to hear uh, that poetry of uh, amazing food from home. I'm good at uh, smuggling, so I can always uh, get, carry stuff in my suitcase. Like, you know, <laughs> they never check the checking luggage. Uh, so I'm going to uh, read some poems from my new book titled Immigrant Prodigal Daughter. Um, I'm going to start with the second poem in the book, which is called Tango on the Boulevards in the City. I dance with your laughter. The city opens its arms, lights on, bookstores galore, chocolate voluptuous. Boulevards tempting, galleries lush with secrets. Everything you have touched has blossomed. Everything you have wished for has arrived. Everything purple and blue has tuliped. Stilettos and turquoise, fishnet stockings and watercolors, stealthiness and persistence. The sound of your steps on the marble of the plaza, osmosis, single-mindedness, willfulness, Obstinacy dredges up insomnia and doubt. Everything you have painted has brought about a tango of innuendo. You have hypnotized the moon. You have cheated on me with me. The next poem is titled, Grammar is a Map. I should say, uh, Clara, I, uh, I was one of uh, Mircea Cartarescu's students. Um, he was teaching us literatura uh, pashoptista, old literature. And he was young and hot. I mean, he's still hot now, but you can imagine he was probably still in his 20s. He was a TA in Pitar Mosh. Anyway, this poem is not about uh, Cartaresco. I just brought that up. Um, grammar is a map. The words I know in another language are like benches in the shade where a friend waits for me in every town and holds my hand. My tour guide for an ancient city, each sentence has wisdom to impart. Stand tall, send money to your sister. Write a note with seven reasons you respect your brother. Grammar is a map. What a miracle to be here. What a heavenly gift to breathe in this thought with these words that I was not born into. How I miss the milk of my mother's song. Delicate or rustic, the words in my native tongue remind me of a gate, a porch, and a threshold. O porta, un pridvor, si un prag. Grammar is a bride of promises, a lattice of veils. Grammar is a groom of confidence, imparts strengths and secrets, teaches with tenderness. To speak in another language is to be courageous and humble, to ask for forgiveness with each syllable, each gesture. Please forgive my offenses. Forget my mistakes because I have learned every word in another language with prayer and sweat. 
I have walked the country of your grammar, listened and repeated, and have yet to learn to let go of my trespasses. All the words in other languages I have grasped have taught me the sweetness of silence. If I had kept quiet, I'd still be a philosopher. Daka the chai, philosopher manai. Um, this next poem is called Bequeathed to Me. We work too hard. Don't obsess about hair. Don't do our nails. We buy cheap shoes that hurt. So we have to buy another pair. And the one, that one is even cheaper because we feel guilty that we bought a new one. We buy cheap clothes and then we don't like them because they look cheap. We don't have enough room to organize our cheap clothes and end up wearing the same 10 pieces because we cannot find the other ones and all of them look cheap anyway. We love our family with food, heal ourselves, with food, show love with food, express our faith with food, deny ourselves food, make public our restraint from food, plan our weeks around food, consider ourselves worthy because we control our food. We communicate with our dead with food, send them food, Make them their favorite placente, bake for them round whole wheat bread, spend a whole day wrapping sarmale and give it all to an old man who can't cook. Somewhere, our fathers wish we had better sit down and rested against the back of the chair, breathed. Maybe they wish we had prepared less food. Um, I'm going to read a poem that appeared in poetry in May. And it's a little while, even for me. Butter, olive oil, flour. Even the grocery list is a love poem, a prayer. God, let me keep what I love. Peaches, cheap. Books, brilliant. Mine so I can underline. How aromatic the apricots. How sharp the novels. Together, we have planted an orchard. I don't understand the word defensive. Are you supposed to just sit there? I don't think we have this word in Romanian. We also don't have a word for camel toe. Or panty line. If you don't see one, does it mean you're going commando? You always put a spell on me. And everything I want is here. But where am I? You missed the bus. Blaming your mother is like blaming the bus driver for the frost. Shopping online for a perfect black dress 
is harder than online dating. Salute to the women who drive a van across the country with the pieces they wanted after the funeral. In her 80s, one of my friends sent back some of the gifts I sent to her over the years. A grandmother clock is worse than insomnia. A snake, wasted time curled inside, waits to strike its venomous bite, poisoning the morning. Keep the clock. Give me the earrings. Your mother catches a glimpse of you every time you look in the mirror. And uh, the last poem I'm going to read is called Temptation. I find sandals for me when looking for gifts. Confusion. I buy two dresses for me when shopping for canning jars. Some claim gold has healing properties. Right. Money helps. I research claims about the benefits of silver, kissing of icons, silver chalice, silver spoons. Temptation. At the Kurturesht bookstore in Bucharest, they don't arrange the books in alphabetical order, so I pick every book on the shelves and buy all of them till the plane dips. Temptation. My sister has bought enough books to build a mansion. Her daughter's mansion is in those books. She's getting a six-year undergraduate degree in architecture. There should be a law about sharing your books, like communal forest bathing, recycling archetypal love stories. Do you lend your books? Giving a book as a gift is like buying a string bikini for your friend. When you know, you know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucia. Some of your lines, oh my God, I just love your work. Thank you. And our next reader is Claudia. She is the author of seven poetry collections, most recently, In Those Years, No One Slept, Broadstone Books, 2023. She won a Pushcart Prize, the Joanne Scott Kennedy Memorial Prize, and the New Letters Readers Award for her poems. She is founding editor of National Translation Month, serves on the board of the Red Wheelbarrow Poets, and co-host their monthly readings. And I give you Claudia. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. It's so fun to see everyone here. Thank you for spending uh, your evening with us and with poetry. Um, and um, I want to read. I'll start by reading a couple of poems from Two Parties to Die a Little, uh, my book that um, Gloria published in 2015. And I'll start with, uh, I'll just mention, um, I don't know how the other Romanian ladies or when did they learn English, but um, I learned, I started to learn English in second grade. And um, we, our teacher used to uh, teach us the English sounds. The hardest sound to teach in Romanian to Romanian kids was the, the from the. So she had a specific method to do that. She told us to hold a pencil between the nose and the chin and stick out the tongue and say the. So this poem is titled The English Lesson. 
For an hour, we have English names. Mine is Peggy, yours is Sue. The teacher with curls draws the letter T with one leg, a hat and a cane. H is a sway, E is a whip. The words jump from the tip of the tongue, struck out to touch the pencil I hold, uniting my nose with the chin. Through the T, the, 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 not the, tongue out, out, lick the pencil, the, the, the pen, the blackboard, the desk we share, the boy with sweaty hands who looks under the skirts until the girls beat him with the backpacks, the Brooklyn Bridge in the open book, the plane that takes me there. And then uh, my first job in New York City was as a hostess in a restaurant. And one day uh, a customer, when she found out that I was from Romania and she saw me kind of a petite frame and she asked me if I'm a gymnast. Breakfast at Cucina. Are you a gymnast? The woman asked when she find out my accent is Romanian. Sure, I'd like to say. In my country, the little girls balance on beams as soon as they come out from the mother's wombs. They jump and land in incredible poses, always scoring a perfect 10, just like Nadia. The capital Bucharest is just Budapest suburbia, where vampires flock at sundown, rushing to Dracula's parties. We shoot our dictators only once every hundred years. But don't worry, Ceausescu is alive and well on Elvis' secret island. Are you a gymnast? The question leaps and lingers in midair between the teacup and the woman's lips. No, I answer, but I could be one, the way I bend backwards sometimes just to get through the day. So this other book, in those years, no one slept. There's a book, it's a more serious book, more somber, uh, about, about history and family. And uh, I'm gonna read uh, a few poems about my father. And here's one titled 1954. In 1954, hands in his pockets, Frank O'Hara was walking at noon on the glaring New York City streets, thinking of poems and lunch. At 7 p.m., the sun was still strong in Romania. My father was 14 at the time and plowed his father's land hard as concrete with a horse blind in one eye, thinking, no doubt, about poems and dinner. On Fifth Avenue, O'Hara stopped, lit a cigarette, breathed in the smoke and looked at the sky. My father stopped and smoked too, maybe even at the same time, inhaled exhaled and looked at the same sky. Yes, they were young, skinny and thoughtful and didn't know each other, but I imagined them sharing the gestures of lighting up, tight lips holding the cigarette, the flicker, the blue breath, the crust of the earth, the sun. Decades later, I'm reading the lunch poems on the bus, another bus poem, and think of the lives of these two men each one caught in his own grinding machine. When the rabbit runs from the field in Romania into a bar in New York City, foolish enough to believe it can escape. So I'm, I'm going to Romania, as I'm sure uh, many of us do. I'm trying to go every year if I can. Uh, oh, okay. And a few years back, my father was in the hospital and we thought we lost him or we're losing them. And I wrote a couple of poems. This one is titled Shivers. At the end of the summer, my hands hold a mason jar. It's lid tightly closed to, so nothing can escape. In the jar, my hands hold another jar, lid closed. Inside that jar, a little girl holds a jar. And in her jar, she holds not a firefly, but a chair, the chair her father used to sit on 
at the head of the table. She's showing me her jar. The chair is on fire. A black and spotty moth landed on my leg and when I cl it, cl it closed its wings, it revealed my father's face, toothless and unshaven. I waved it off my skin and his face moved into a cloud to look at me, tragic and frowned a few minutes longer. My father is in intensive care again and I see his heart in the blue hospital of the sky. White, cluttered and immobile, it floats about my head among cotton pads, rolls of gauze and clusters of fluffy lungs. If I could transfer my blood inside your old veins, if I could mix it with water so you could drink it, if I could transfer into you some of my youth, I'd do it quickly so the nurses don't notice. And you'd ask feeling your head heavy and your heart racing, you'd ask slurring your words slightly, what is it I'm feeling inside my body? This throbbing in my arteries, these movements of vast schools of fish. And I answer, shh, daddy, don't worry. It's just me pushing out this infection, giving you some strength back. I'll be gone soon. And this one is titled Bar Hopping. I wonder if the water in his lungs is salty like the waves lapping at my feet. He once told me if I passed the entrance exam to the university, he'd take me bar hopping. And I laughed, why would I go bar hopping with my father? I got past the exam and we never went to any bars or to the Black Sea again. Now the sea has come back searching for him. Water climbed into his lungs and the machine pumps oxygen to help him breathe in and out like the tides. If he were awake, I'd tell him, when you get out of the hospital, I'll take you bar hopping and to the beach again. The sea rolls on the shore, endless hope, endless, endless, endless. Um, the hands. Ghostly vain hands reach into my dream. Are they yours? Are they the smoke exhaled by my best friend in high school who used to go through a pack a day? Or are they my father's labored breaths when he wakes at night and turns on the oxygen machine? My mother's hands hang towels on the clo clothesline in Romania, and I extend my hands to collect them in New Jersey. Our fingers almost touch over the Atlantic. The towels smell of fog and beat like, like birds in my arms. And in the night, they turn into the hands of my unborn children. The same hands the black sea waves from afar, flickering like seagulls on my bedroom ceiling. So I'm asking, are these the hands of death? Arranging my pillow with one and holding sharp pruners with the other. At 3 a.m., I'm cutting branches of burning red maple acer palmatum and place them like lies in the vase on the dining room table. Each leaf shakes a small bloody hand, a childhood memory, silence, because no one would believe its stories. And I want to close with a poem dedicated to my parents, my aging parents. I am glad to say that my father is feeling better. So this is a poem titled Climbing. Each year, my parents grow smaller, summer to summer. They lighten up, climbing into old age like into a tree, shedding their shoes, coats, hats, shirts, socks, pocket change, mom's purse, dad's wristwatch, their wedding rings. I wonder if they transfer their weight onto me, if I get heavier year to year, if my words of my dreams get denser, and I carry them slower like rocks or lead in my pockets. My parents get lighter and lighter like birds or balloons rising into the old age tree until I can't see them any longer. But I know they're still there, climbing, hidden from view among the tall branches. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Claudia. That was wonderful.
all of you have such amazing use of language. There's humor, everything, and, and of course, sadness. Just really wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your work tonight.